Class is in session. Welcome to Unlearn 16. Class is in session. Today's just me. Today, you guys just get me in my lonely, lonely glory. Um, I was having trouble coming up with what I wanted to talk about today because I knew I wanted to do something very personal. Um, and and I, guys, it's been a rough go. And um, the more that I share, you guys are like therapy for me. So thank you. I'll be sending each of you $150 uh, via Interact Transfer in order for this therapy. But I think it's important. I think it's important for us, for me, to be able to put all of this stuff on the table so we can all sort of have this shared experience and draw from it what we need. So let me catch you up. For those who haven't been following my TikTok insanity, about a year ago, I would say a year ago in October, my mom, um, you know, obviously this amazing person in my life, and I'm going to get into those stories too, because I think those stories are important when I'm talking about this. But a year ago, my mom was diagnosed with bladder cancer. Um, now I got to go a little further back and, and here's why I got to go a little further back because my mom hates the doctors. Now there's some irony there. I understand. Uh, my mom was a nurse for like 50 years. Um, she worked in plastics. I pretty much grew up in a hospital. I'm going to tell you a few of those stories. So why on earth she was so afraid or so trepidatious about taking care of her own physical health? I don't know if that's because she was a nurse and she saw what could happen and she thought better just to ignore it or if it was just something innate to her. She's very much a caregiver, um, but to be taken care of, she, she's not having any of it. Um, so let me go back. I'm sorry. This is like one of those TV shows where they kind of go forward and then go back. So you're going to have to, you know, keep, keep track here, guys. If you can keep up with me, I'd appreciate it. Uh, it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. So quite a few years ago, um, after my mom retired, so my mom retired, oh, I don't know, about five years ago now. And it was at this five-year mark when she retired, it was like everything went wrong. And, and slowly pieces that she never, I guess maybe she never dealt with. It's kind of like when you work for an exceptionally long period of time, you never get sick. And then you have a weekend yourself and all of a sudden you get slammed with a cold that you've never had. I, th I feel like it was kind of like that. And initially, I believe my mom hit was, was hit with a gallbladder thing. Now, I think my mom's always had a gallbladder thing and she had it taken out. She came through like a champ, although it kind of shook her sense of mortality, obviously. She then got atrial fib fibrillation. I can't even say that properly. AFib, which is this heart thing in a regular heartbeat, which in and of itself isn't problematic. You get these bouts of AFib, you take a medication, it regulates your heart rate again, you go about your day. Now, my mom's always had high blood pressure. I think it's familial. My mom used to be a heavier person. So obviously there's a genetic and a lifestyle component. And all of these things kept happening. And it was just like one after the other. And, and there's me constantly saying, you're fine. This is, you got this, you got this right? Never thinking of a bigger picture. And then it came around to, um, they, they found, and I don't know, go in details here because, you know, nobody wants to hear the gory details, but they found that she had a polyp in her uterus. I've had polyps in my uterus. I've had them taken out trying to get pregnant. That's annoying. So again, familial, genetic, right? So she had a fairly good sized polyp removed from her uterus. She came through with flying colors everything was fine. And for quite a while after she was having some post-op bleeding. Now, couldn't really tell why. And at some point her gynecologist said, you know what? I think you should look at your bladder because, oh, and to jump back a little bit, my mom used to 35 years ago smoke and she smoked for about 20 years. And then she quit cold Turkey funnily enough, had nothing to do with the health concerns. It had everything to do with the up cost of cigarettes at that particular time. And she quit. Done. Never to have one again. So she's been off cigarettes longer than she was on them. And her gynecologist said, the secondary leading cause of cancer in bladder are smokers. 
So immediately my mom was like, that's it. That's what she has. And, she, and, and it was all doom and gloom. And I said, yeah, mom, I'm going to feel, I don't know if I'm going to feel guilty about this, but mom, how, I've watched a lot of house. You're not going to have two things wrong with you at the same time. You're going to have this huge polyp. And you're also, no, that not going to happen. It's not going to be a thing. And sure enough, the more tests that we got, she had the different tests in order to see what it was. And sure enough, that's what it was. And then we had to go and she had to have the surgery to figure out how significant was it, right? Because you only can kind of guess by scans. And all the while, I'm like, you just can't have the world's worst luck time and time again. It's you, you there's gotta be something on your side, right? You're in, she's this guys like she has taken care of people, whether it's me, whether it's my family, whether it's all of those people she's nursed for, for, for decades and decades. I'm like, this, not going to be it. So they went in to do the surgery and there's different levels, right? They went in to do the surgery and they couldn't just take what they wanted to be able to do is just take out the tumor from inside of her bladder. So I guess because the bladder is a full organ or whatever, and excuse me, guy, please don't come at me for any medical kind of stuff. I'm going to do the best I can here, but I do watch a lot of house and grace, but I only can do so much. There's a full bladder and, and it's a sealed organ. So hopefully it's just in there and you go in, you scrape it out. Bob's your uncle. You're good to go. What you don't want is you don't want it pushing or breaching the wall and going into the musculature of the external organ. So I'm at school waiting to hear about the surgery because you can't go in because of COVID. And of course, um, it had breached the, the wall. So, okay. All right. So they're going to take the whole thing out. So they're going to take the bladder out. And because my mom is 73, the uterus is so close in proximity. And that's usually where the transfer happens or the, you know, any cells that escaped can go there. So they took both her uterus and her bladder out. So, oh, okay. They say, look, clean margins, everything's good, everything's gone. Before the surgery, by the way, and I know I'm jumping all over the place, she did the full rounds of chemo um, and she handled it like a champ. Like when I say handled like a champ, I, I am comparing it to me and I would have been a complete and utter whiny mess, but she handled it like a champ. Um, her kidneys took a hit though. Because chemo, as everybody knows, chemo is very, very hard on your kidneys. And also because the bladder, obviously the kidney flows into the bladder, it had gone up part of that conduit a little bit and it had infected, not infected with cancer, but it had caused trauma to that kidney. So there was kidney damage. Okay. Okay. So we get her through that. I go see her in the hospital. And again, you know, it was a rough surgery. It's a big, guys, she lost two organs. Like, like that's significant. I asked her if she felt lighter. Anyways, so I go into the hospital and she's handling it like a champ. It's hard for her to get up. And it's, it was a big, it was a big incision, right? Belly button to pelvic bone kind of incision. Nothing laparoscopic there. And and I see her in the hospital and, and I'm trying to like, make sure that she's okay. I'm trying to bring her the right foods. I'm trying to, you know, do all of that, that I can. And while she's in the hospital, which I think was an actual, a significant aspect of this whole progress, she gets um, a very, very common GI infection. Now I'm not going to talk about how angry I am that she got it. Yeah, I'm sure you can read my face, nor how angry I am that it was probably left too long because they should have tested for it earlier. It's very contagious. It should be tested for very, you know, very quick after surgery, but she got this. And, and this was, this particular um, GI infection really did a number on her rehab, a number on her health, a number on everything, and even worse, a number on her kidney. So she 
in the hospital taking care of this and they want her to come home. Well, she doesn't look like she's ready to come home, guys. But in a lot of our medical systems right now, and, I, and I'm saying part of, a lot of this I'm saying because, and I'm going to share with you, because I think it's so incredibly important to self-advocate. And the problem is we, me, most of us don't know enough how to self-advocate, right? But here's what you do know. You do know how your person feels. So when my mom said, I'm not ready, I'm not ready to come home. I should have fought a little harder for that. But I, I was a bit selfish, right? I wanted her home. I thought I could take better care of her. I thought, I don't know what I thought. I don't know what I thought. But, but my mom also hated in the hospital. So it, it was a hard balancing act. So I brought her home. And we brought her home. My uncle was here and I was taking care of the dog and he was here. And guys, she was so sick. And it looked so scary to me. And it looked so traumatic when she was in this house and she was still having some post-op bleeding, which is a, a little bit common, but I, I, she was afraid. And, and that fear should have told me something a little bit more too. And we waited a few days. She was home for about a few days. And then I saw her and, and she was, she was afraid because it was a little bit more bleeding. And I said, we're going to go back. We're going to go back and we're going to go back until you're okay. And so there it is. My mom, I get her back into the car, which was incredibly hard. It was really incredibly hard for her to stand up. She had a lot of edema, which was swelling. And it was difficult to get her from A to B, but I got her there. And we took her back down to the hospital. And I'm purposely not mentioning hospital names right now because I still want her to get well. And I'm trying not to be angry or um, persecutory yet. Um, because it's hard. I get it. It's hard. And guys, this was all happening amidst the insanity of COVID. So I'm trying to leave that too, right? And we get to the hospital. And I know a lot of my TikTok listeners know this story because I get to the hospital and I go in to, to emerge and I say, I can't get my mom out of the car. Can you please send somebody to help? And this beautiful, amazing um, paramedic came out. His name was, is Adam. Um, I, I, I put together a lovely thank you for him as well. And he came out and he treated my mom like a human being. He got down on one knee as soon as he saw her in the car. And he said, listen, he looked her right in the eyes and he goes, we're going to do this because my mom was in pain. We're going to do this exactly how you have to do it. It can take five minutes. It can take five hours. I got you. And we're, and we're going to do this together. And he asked her what her name was and would use her name. And, you know, and, and I said, are you, should I stay here? He's like, no. He goes, you can't stay here. You can't come in. He goes, don't worry. I got her. And I'm going to stay with her for the entire duration until I know she's where she's supposed to be. Now, this is a paramedic. He doesn't work for the hospital, right? I don't know if he was off duty or what. He, he doesn't work for the hospital. He's a param He works externally, right? So, I mean, he, he goes in there. Mom said, I'm okay. I'm okay. And, I, and then I was talking to my mom. And this young man. And I say young man, cause I'm old. I can say that he stayed with her for the entire time until she got taken to an actual floor. He took her up to the floor. He took her up to the floor. He stayed with her no matter what anybody said, just leave her here. He goes, no, nope, I'm good. I'm going to stay right here. He stayed with her no matter what. And he gave my mom something that day that a, I'll never forget, and B, neither will she. And I think it really helped her get through what she needed to get through at that point, which was a self, sort of this awareness of an identity, of, of, of a, being a person again, of somebody looking at her and saying, I care about you. I'm going to make sure you're okay. I don't care what else is happening out there. And so he stayed with her. And everybody kept saying, you know, oh, you're just going to, you're, you're going to, you don't need to stay with her. We got her. We got her. And, and that happened for a little while. And that happened for a little while. And eventually she got to where she was supposed to be. And he said, you know, you're going to be okay. I'm going to check in. And, she, and he did check in on her. And then she went back into the hospital. And at this point, she felt a little empowered. She felt a little empowered by Adam, a little empowered by, by herself going, she knew she had to go back in. 
And she said to everybody in that hospital, listen, I'm not, I can't go back home like this. So I'm going to have to go to like, let's say a rehab clinic because her walking was difficult. Even walking with a walker was problematic. Like everything was really hard and I couldn't be there 24 seven. So she said to them, I, I, I'm going to wait. Now here's the funny part. And this is the part I want you guys to listen to. The standard with which a hospital is willing to transfer a patient, is willing to transfer a patient when it comes to going to rehab or going to home are very different, completely different standards. Going home, it was as though she only had to be at a maybe a four out of 10. Go ahead, you're good. You're good to go home at a four. Why? Because you have all these people at home that's gonna help you. When my mom said, I'm going to go to rehab, guess what standard you have to be to go to rehab? You got to be at a solid seven. Are you kidding me? So another healthcare institution that is dedicated to taking my mom from being hospitalized for weeks, major surgery at 73, well, 72 then, taking her and being able to get her up to a level where she can actually come home, that rehab facility says to the hospital, you can't send her to us at a four. We can't take care of her at a four. It's probably the most frustrated I've ever been. And I, and I did speak to management and I did go through a bunch of different things, but I had to talk, um, you know, I had to talk to those people and sort of assert where we stood here all the while stipulating, well, she's going to go to rehab. She was never going to rehab. I was never going to, she wasn't going to rehab because I realized, oh my God, by the time you're good enough to go to rehab, mom, you can come home because then I can take care of you. Right? Because then you're at an eight. So I, I, that part of our, of our healthcare system, that needs to change. That needs to change. You can't assume And, you know, I'm obviously younger to take care. You can't assume that that person has those people when she goes or he goes home from the hospital after major surgery. It's all to save money, by the way. By the way, guys, this is all about the bottom line. This is not about health care. It's about health business. And I'm in Canada. And I know the States is different on different levels. I know they have their problems. Absolutely. Do I believe in universal health care? Yes. But I believe in a fully funded health care model that doesn't send patient home early so they can get more sick and more scared and have a harder time of it. So my mom came home after all of that. And guys, it was a rough go. It was a really rough go. So her surgery um, was in May. And slowly but surely, we got her. Thank goodness that I was he- I was here. I know this sounds hilariously ironic, but I was here because of COVID. I could teach online, and I could help take care of the dog and make sure she was okay, and I could go grocery shopping for her, and I could do all those things for her. And she was really on the mend. And as she was on the mend, um, she was still having an edema problem, so getting rid of fluid. That's probably a kidney issue, separate. They said, okay, well, we do scans, right? And as they were doing scans, they saw something little in her lung. They thought, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. No big deal. It's probably old infection. It's pro- it could be old COVID. It could be anything. We're going to leave it. We're going to watch it. So they watched it for months. And very recently, they said, okay, well, it got a bit bigger. So let's go. We're going to go in and do a biopsy. So they went in and did a biopsy and did tests on the biopsy. And it turns out to be a bladder cancer metastasis. Oh, I can't say that word. It, it was spread. So her bladder cancer, which is also weird, but again, apparently it's where it goes. One of the first places that bladder cancer will metastasize to is the lung. I didn't know that. I feel like they should have known that a little bit. They had tables of doctors looking at it on scans and saying, no, that's not what it is. It's not that at all. Don't worry about it. So now, you know, we get this news. Now, this news comes with a a limit. 
and I know a lot of people are going through and have gone through. And the reason why I'm doing this is, is for, for me, hundred percent, hundred percent for me. And it's also for everybody else who's listening and everybody else who's going through it or might go through it or, or any position on that timeline. Um, you know, they sat us down and they said, there's no, we can't, you can't have a cure now. So before with the bladder removed, there was a chance at a cure. So now there's no cure. Okay. Now there's these possible options. Will we do surgery? Probably not. I don't know if that's because she's 73 or that's because of whatever, but probably not. It would be a big deal. We want to shrink the tumor. Okay. So she gives us a window, a window of, you know, I don't know if I even want to say it out loud, guys. You know what? I'm not, I'm not going to, I don't want to give it any more power than it already has, but they gave us a window which kind of stops you dead in your tracks, doesn't it? A prognosis, a timeline, an end game, it kind of stops you dead in your tracks and you just kind of go, and, and, and this window doesn't include healthy years, right? This window can include X amount of healthy years and then a whole bunch of years of not. So we don't know, we don't know. So I had my moment and I, again, people on TikTok really saw me have my moment because I didn't know where else to put it. This is a much more calm version of me. I have my moment of panic. What do I do? What do I do now? How do I, how, how do we play out? Because it, it was almost as though somebody gave me this, this timeline and, and then that's it. We're done. That's all I'm, that's all I'm giving you. Have a nice day. And I, I gave up. I, I looked at that timeline and thought, that's definitive. <clears throat> and I didn't know what else to do. Because then I'm like, do we go on trips? Do I quit school? Do I, do I take a time off? Like, what do we do here? You know, and my mom was, was up and down, but my mom's way stronger than me. Have I said that before? Leaps and bounds stronger than me. So we take this time and, and it doesn't, it's not long. And I pour my heart out on a TikTok. Now, some people would be like, oh, how dare you pour your heart out on something like that? I, I didn't get any actually hate because of it, but I'm sure some people might think it's opportunistic or it's whatever, but I didn't know what else to do. And again, I'll send you guys each my $150 for the hour because I feel like this process is my therapy, right? I'm a talker. Apparently I don't need a lot of coming back all the time. And then, so I told this story to some degree and I got, not only did I get love and support and all of that amazing energy, and I appreciate that, but here's what I got. And here's where I, how, what I want to pass on. I got actual, uh, not even miracles. Cause right now I'm, I'm betting on a miracle, right? They said X about I'm betting on a miracle. But these people are like, Joanna, my dad, my cousin, my kid, my mom, my grandfather. It was story after story after story after story of getting cancer A and metastasizing, it going here, it going there, people giving us shelf lives, and them time and time and time again beating it. And I read these and they're like, you should try this. You should call here. It was this network, not just of well wishes and good energy, which I love, but it was a network of information. And I think information on the internet can be overwhelming and doomsday and all of those things. And you don't know what to pull and what not to pull and what has validity and what doesn't have validity. But I know somebody's story. I can listen to somebody's story about what they went through, what can what cancer they had. Now, do I think they all apply? Of course not. Of course not. I'm not I'm not that, you know, easily lifted, but what I was lifted by was this. Time and time again they were given a shelf life. Time and time again they were given limits. And they broke them. They were told two years, they lived seven. They were told five years, they lived 15. There were still people fighting years and years and years later. And how did they do it? They did it because they didn't listen to that diagnosis. I also got therapies I'd never thought about. 
So therapies now that I can bring to my oncologist, therapies like this directed radiation thing, uh, there, there's an acronym, CBRT, something like that. I'm sure you guys will correct me. And this is very, relatively new and it's directed radiation right at the tumor itself. And I read this and I read a little bit of the parameters around it. It works well on primary cancer and metastasized cancer. So both forms. And I, and I listened to this and I, and I read this and I, I was energized and I, and I all of a sudden realized how dare I let the opinions of a handful of doctors who, by the way, I respect doctors. I absolutely, I grew up in a hospital. I took my first steps to my mom's head nurse. I spent most of my new years in one of those comfy chairs in hospitals with a, another nurse's daughter because they were both single parents. I grew up, I, I feel very safe in hospitals, but the one thing I think that I was lacking isn't this idea where you question everything and you throw it all out, the baby out with the bathwater, that whole horrible, that's a horrible metaphor, by the way, or analogy, baby out with the bath. But what I am saying is this, because I grew up in, and with such high reverence and respect, when somebody says to me, wearing one of those nice coats, this is the, this is the time allotted, I believe them. I did. I believe them. I go, oh, well, they have all of this training and all of this. I, be I believe them. And what I've come to understand, and as you get older, I think you, and if you're listening, you understand that just because they're wearing that jacket doesn't really doesn't make them an expert. Like not an expert in my mom, right? They have a general idea and they, again, all the education, all the respect in the world, they don't know everything. They're not all powerful and all knowing. They just aren't. And the more stories I heard, the more I realized how true that was and how I've always wanted a doctor. And I've always respected doctors that said, this is my best idea. This is not, this is not the only idea. And I've really come to respect doctors more and more that can do that because at the end of the day, they know that they have, you know, limited information. Like my mom and all the different things, it's like she has seven different doctors taking care of seven different body parts. Well, who's taking care of the whole picture? Nobody. No, nobody really. I'm counting on you to know her lungs, you to know her kidneys, you to know her lymphatic system, you to know about her thrombosis clinic stuff, which is all about blood thinners and stuff like that. Look, all of you, and then you can give me the information and somehow I'm going to compete. Who's in charge of all of it? And then, and then who's in charge of the human spirit? I know that that sounds like, you know, kind of cheesy a little bit, especially coming from me. And I'm not talking religion and I'm not talking so I'm not talking any of, I am talking about our sheer willpower and ability to bring things into existence that we deem vital. That positivity that is, and everybody says it, a positive attitude, right? Everybody says it, but everybody underplays that because your mentality and your, your belief system and what you think going in really does shape what you have getting out. And that happens in so many different ways, but especially when it comes to your health. So I listened. I listened to that. I really did. And, and these the social media, people slam on social media for all sorts of reasons. Nah, to hell with that. To hell with that. Guys, I put out this panic and this fear and this desperation, when I got, you want to know what I got back? I got love back and I got so many options and I got my spirit back. I, I know I, you guys are going to be like, Joanne, you sound ridiculous. Your spirit, what are you talking about? But I'm telling you, it was the most powerful thing. So I, I do that TikTok and then I get on to a live. Day after, kind of decompressed pulled it together a little bit. 
And I started listening to people's stories on lives. And then who comes on my live? Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie O'Donnell pops on as a guest. If you guys have ever seen that, I immediately cry. I don't know. There's something maternal about her that makes me cry. She's very caretaking, right? And she gets on and she doesn't try to fix anything. She just listens. She's been through a lot herself. And if you know her story, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and she says a few things. She goes, it's, there's no finality. No doctor has that final anything, period. So don't you dare succumb to that, number one. Number two, I know some people at Sloan Kettering. I know doctors. I'm going to give you their number. And when you need that second opinion or you need to go somewhere because this isn't good enough, I'm going to give you that connection. And number three, and this is an important one. I'll try to articulate the best I can. Sometimes, all the time, actually, we need to find a way to talk about death and about losing people we love and about the limits on our mortality and our lives and figure out a way to live with that knowledge, not in denial of it. We live in such denial of it. Me too. Me a hundred percent. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Such denial of it. And accepting our mortality doesn't mean you're accepting those parameters. That's not what she was talking about. She was simply saying, we all get to be in this space. And I'm paraphrasing. We all get to be in this space with people that we love. And it's up to us to utilize that space to our best possible potential. We're all in rooms with people. Don't you dare waste a minute of it. And don't you dare think that by being with somebody at the end of that life is any less important or any less powerful or, or, or sometimes enjoyable, right? You're going to have moments of greatness in that time, even if there is an end. And by the way, there's always an end. We just don't know when it's going to happen. You know, I talked to my mom about all of these and I showed her all of these messages and we, we, we talked about different treatments. We talked about Sloan Kettering. We talked about Rosie and all of this stuff. And I saw her energized. Does it change it? I don't know. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, it's this kind of energy that is powerful. That is a better way to live, even if you know one day you're going to die because we all are. Does that sound dark? I feel like that sounds really dark. It's not meant to sound dark. You know, some of us get a long life. Some of us get less of that. Some, we, some of us get to spend years and years and years with our loved ones. And some of us get to spend a handful of minutes. But it's what we do with that time that matters. So, you know, I thought about what am I going to do? What am I going to do with my mom? I got to do all the, no. What I need to do with my mom is what I've always done. Enjoy life. Don't wait. We're not going to wait for something bad to happen. We are going to live when we feel good and we feel happy and healthy. We are going to live to our biggest potential, to our most powerful selves. We are going to show. My mom found all this out, right? We're down at the hospital, downtown Toronto, and on the way home, because we were in a bit of shell shock, she looks at me and says, you know what? I really want that purse. And I said, what purse? She liked this purse at the bay. I said, well, let's go get it. She goes, really? I said, yeah. Because it, what, whatever was talked about there is not the, this, today's not the end. You know? And then we had some hard talks. We had some talks where, listen, tomorrow... Anything could happen tomorrow for good, for bad, for the ugly. Anything can happen tomorrow. So we need to figure out how to be empowered today. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you guys what I'm going to do. Rosie might've given me a bit of a push to do this for a long time. I've been wanting to write a book. My mom was a single parent is a single parent. Um, and a lot of my stories, a lot of who I am, is because of her. Some of it's not, but she's been there for all of my stories, 
all of the ups, the downs, the amazing things, the heartbreaks, the gut wrenching, everything. And I've always wanted to write that, especially just to give you a little heads up. My mom and my grandmother and I, because my parents got divorced young, we used to drive from Toronto to Florida every year from ages like three to 16, every year as a, as a vacation. And guys, I'm not going to tell you the stories, but the stories from those trips, hilarious, absolutely hilarious. And they're all very poignant and they all have such depth and such application. When I look back on them, just like the beginning of this podcast, when I told you my why, my why is always going to come back to my mom, my family. And I think that's powerful. And I, and, and so when I thought about writing a book, I thought about writing it in the vein of five people you meet in heaven. I know that I'm not really copying Mitch. I'm so sorry. If you haven't re read that book, please go read it. But this idea of powerful moments in our lives and what they meant then and why they were important then, and then how we can see the ripple effects. I think that's incredibly important. So my mom and I are going to shop. We do that well. My mom and I are going to um, reminisce. We are going to record these books, which I always wanted to do in order to make sure I get as much perspective as I possibly can. At Christmas, we are going to have family over. We are going to go see family in order to build out the stories and build out this amazing thing that's gotten to be my life and our lives. And we're going to do it all. Um, together and it's and it's already been powerful it's already been funny now initially i thought about it as a book right and then rosie said something to me that i'm not going to forget even though it makes me feel wildly uncomfortable because i can do this here with you all cuz i know you're listening you're going driving to work or maybe you're watching me on youtube or whatever it is you're doing but there's some distance here i don't have to look you in the eye and she said, that's not just a book. That's a one woman show. That's a, that's a, a life encapsulating, poignant, uh, giving this amazing perspective into who I am, why I am, but maybe, maybe, and this is what I hope for, it, ha it resonates for others. Pieces of it resonate for others. I told this whole story, A, to get it off my chest and to talk about people advocating and living life and, and all of those things, whatever it is you can pull out of this pot. I don't know what you're going to pull out. Sometimes it's just a train of thought. Again, you get my $150. But I think when the more that we listen to people's stories, and I'm a history teacher at heart, the more we understand people, the more we understand what our potential can be. Because we're not limiting, limiting it just to what we envision anymore. Our brains have so much power, right? We have so much power to go out. And I honestly believe that sometimes the only thing that limits what we can do, how we can heal, what kind of power we have, isn't anybody external. It's everything in here. It's everything that's in our head. It's everything we've told us. And I think for the most of my life, ironically, I've lived in, in a box, even though my haircut's like this and, you know, whatever. But I've lived in a box. I've lived in a box of you go to school, you get educated, you get a good job, you take care of your family, you do you get a house, you get a, right, drive the right car. That kind of box. Never, never rolling, never taking a big risk. I was always terrified of this kind of thing, terrified of acting, terrified of all that stuff because I was insecure. And, you know, a, a, a divorce, COVID, your mom getting cancer has a way of really knocking the insecurity right on its own. And, and maybe I'm still insecure, right? Maybe I don't know if I can do it, but I'll be damned if I'm not going to try now. I'll be damned if I'm just going to give in because it gives you this perspective that you've, I've never had. I've never had. And I think that's so incredibly important. It's empowering as much as it is devastating. So I think, I don't know. I mean, this was a big podcast, right? I think, I think my bottom line here 
if I had a bottom line, which I rarely do because I, you know, I can ramble. Is this idea, is this concept that in your mind, you know more than you think you do. You have more power than you think you have. Don't let anything external, anything, limit who you can become, how you can become it. Don't let it limit what the potential is. And that doesn't matter if it's a guy in a white suit, doctors, teachers, bosses at work, family members, partners that are, don't let anything like that limit you. Take a look at the big picture. Advocate. When you have that feeling in your gut, advocate. Whether it's for you, whether it's for a person going through a hard time, whether it's for a family member that's fighting, literally for their lives. Understand that all of that experience is power. Sometimes it's crappy, hard power, but it's power. You know, and, and my mom and I can, can look at all of this and, um, I will be with her for all of it. And there will be power in that too. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being an ear. Thanks for being support. And I advocate that you use your power, find it, push it, and never let anything limit who you are and what you can do. Have a great night, guys. We'll see you next week. Dismissed.